Bitcoiners, I just got off with Rob Hamilton. He is an awesome Bitcoiner out there that has been spreading Bitcoin knowledge all over Clubhouse and Bitcoin Twitter spaces. Uh, and Rob is no stranger to Bitcoin Magazine, but this is in podcast that is talking about his first article. This article dives into why the physical world has not progressed as far as the digital world. So we are all living here in 2021. Uh, and technology is everywhere, especially software, SaaS, Silicon Valley. That is what is driving growth. You look at the FANG companies, and they are the majority of the S&P 500. But, you know, the physical, the commodity manufacturers, the car companies, anything beyond just software, it hasn't really performed the same. And uh, Rob thinks part of it is our broken incentives. P Rob thinks part of it is fiat money and money printing this article dives into, uh, you know, what is wrong with the current system, how Bitcoin fixes it. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this conversation with Rob Hamilton. <laughs> Bitcoiners, I am sitting across from Rob Hamilton, someone who's been putting out amazing thought leadership in the space, mostly in audio form in a variety of chat rooms across the interwebs. But I think most notably, maybe, is in this amazing article that you put together for Bitcoin Magazine that got a ton of attention across the Bitcoin space. That's why you're here on the podcast to chat. Um, Rob, you just put together... Uh, you know, a really, I think, uh, a very concrete way to summarize a lot of the big ideas that Bitcoiners have been discussing and thinking about for a while. And you just really put it together in a fantastic article. So y'all check it out. It's going to be in the show notes, but let's just dive into this topic. First, Rob, why don't you introduce yourself to the Bitcoin Magazine podcast? Sure thing. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Rob Hamilton. Uh I guess my Bitcoin journey starts back in 2014. I, uh, a friend told me about it, kind of disregarded it as many of us have with our Bitcoin journey. Uh, a couple months later though, uh, my friend told me like, oh, there's now this thing. I'm going to explain a funny story here. Uh, like there's a thing called Dogecoin and you can mine it on your computer. It's really cool. So I started like with my graphics card as a gamer in my room, like playing with Dogecoin. And I was kind of like, okay, this is kind of fun and silly. And I was living in Westchester at the time working in New York city. And I looked up like, oh, are there like Bitcoin meetups in the area? And sure enough, I, I found this thing called BitDevs, which is like the predominant Bitcoin developer meetup in 2014. And it was, it was really interesting because I was not a programmer at the time. Since then, I've, I, I've t done a lot of self-teaching and like learning about uh, doing more formal programming, but going to a room and seeing like 30, 40 people and going through GitHub pull requests and going down this whole rabbit hole of how like Bitcoin as a technology operates underneath the hood and just being quiet and listening to very smart people. It was very refreshing to be in a room and being like, oh, I'm the dumbest person in this room. And this is amazing. Like I could just be surrounded by people who could drop so much knowledge. And it was really exciting to me and understanding this technology. And I started with my mobile wallet, handing out like 10 million sats to people at work back when Bitcoin was at like 250 bucks being like, Hey, isn't it so cool? I just sent you money over the internet. And of course, almost only one person held onto their wallet years later. Uh, but yeah, like Bitcoin has kind of consumed a lot of my attention since then. It was something that, uh, would always be, it was never like my full-time job or anything, but it was something that always, I was really interested and passionate about. It would always follow along with the project and uh, over the past few months, actually probably during COVID lockdowns, when I had a lot more free time, I started going on this app clubhouse where people would just talk about Bitcoin. And I quickly realized that like, this is a great place for me to have conversations about Bitcoin, which really, you know, I was a lurker on Twitter. I kept mostly quiet, but being able to have long form audio conversations with people really did a lot of great things for me to be able to understand how Bitcoin works even more, being able to meet more Bitcoiners. I was in Miami back in June was an incredible time like being able to meet and like network with Bitcoiners. It's such an empowering, fun feeling. And yeah, I had some ideas that were floating around and uh, I decided that uh, I'd try to give back a little bit to Bitcoin. I have to give full credit to this uh, 
interview that Eric Weinstein had and uh, Peter Thiel, which was really, uh, really, really exciting. And I saw that there was an opportunity to tie it into Bitcoin. So that was kind of where I took the article. Yeah, well, I, just a couple of things I want to comment on. First and foremost, um, you know, it's incredible going to a bit dev meeting and like, you know, here's me, I host a Bitcoin podcast, I work for a Bitcoin media company, I've, you know, put on conferences, and then I'm sitting in SF bit devs pre pandemic, you know, there's uh, Ben, uh, Ben Woosley, uh, Greg Maxwell, uh, Jeremy Rubin, all arguing about bips. And, uh, and then, uh, who is it? It's uh, Alex, the CEO of, uh, of river.com i don't know i'm blinking on on his last Leishman. name yeah alex leishman uh and uh and he's the one who's moderating it and i'm just sitting there just hands held like this tightly holding on to my drink just you know not saying nothing not saying nothing so that's <laughs> right. how freaking intimidating those beat those bit does meetups are but it's awesome and then on the flip side like getting on the clubhouse you know it's amazing how like the the right formula will help you socialize and then you just tap into this bitcoin community and then you know, the pilgrimage, which is the Bitcoin conference. Miami was awesome. I'm looking forward to next year. Um, there's other pilgrimages as well. I think Bitblock Boom is one of those as well. Um, but, you know, just meeting Bitcoiners in person, like that's that last thing. And, you know, this community makes me bullish. And, you know, before we get into this specific topic, it's just, um, you know, I guess you kind of talk about like what has been lagging in the world and, you know, the type of innovation we haven't had. That's a big part of this, this idea. Um, but you know, Bitcoiners on the flip side kind of make me bullish on we can we can write that ship, uh, and you can see it in the community. Absolutely, yeah. I think it, it's this one thing where Bitcoin is this really abstract concept. If you only interact through it uh, over the internet via Twitter conversations, it, it you feel this different energy when you're surrounded by people, and it's not that you have to drop your guard. You just don't have to spend a bunch of time thinking about like you know, oh, I need to explain and justify why I believe Bitcoin is an important technology. Like you're able to have deeper conversations once you have that uh, alignment of ideas, which I think is something that as someone who I wish I got to speak and be with Bitcoiners more often, it's something that I'm lacking. And I find it to be really refreshing when I get to sit across the table, you know, and have conversations and drinks with Bitcoiners. You get to have more interesting conversations as opposed to just justifying you know, is Bitcoin going to succeed? Will the mass culture adopt it? Right? Like, I will people spend it? Years, How high is the price going to go? <laughs> right. I feel like th those conversations are just so like, they're important to have. And as you're learning, I think those are important things that you want to be really critical of and start thinking and evaluating. But the, but the meat of the conversation, the real interesting stuff is just kind of, let's just assume for a moment that Bitcoin has won. I'm not taking it for granted that it's a guarantee, but I think that's where the more compelling conversations to be had is, okay, we're in a future where we're in a hyper Bitcoinized world. What next, right? Like, like, what do we do? And I think that's kind of one of the prompts for why I decided to write the piece is because, you know, fixing the money does a lot, but I think there's other problems and conversations to be had around how do we restructure a society that I think in many ways uh, there's a, there's a common feeling, you know, independent of your political ideology of failing institutions that, you know, that we're in a place of great uncertainty at the moment. And like, how do we build forward, right? Like, how do we go forward? Because taking down the Federal Reserve, I think, is a noble cause that I greatly align with and stopping central banking. I think it's a very, like, it's really important. But there's so many other things in the world outside of the money. And how do we continue the conversation past that? So the title of the piece, and we've been kind of jumping around this, is why has the physical world not progressed like the digital? Um, you know, I think being in COVID land now, just we've all been kind of exposed to um, how to socialize on the internet and how to kind of bridge those, the physical barriers that have been put up in the world that didn't, you know, used to be so obvious um, pre-COVID. Um, and it's obvious that the internet is a magical, amazing place, right? And so much innovation has kind of come from it. But um, when you look around at like the visions of the future outside of the internet and the internet connectivity and like the power of fiber and stuff like that, you know, we haven't gone that far. And maybe I'm just being ungrateful um, or a dick, but you know, I think you 
you kind of agree with that. I know Peter Thiel and Eric Weinstein agree with that. Can you talk a little bit about their conversation and then, you know, how that tallies into this, this problem that uh, you ha- have identified in the piece? A- absolutely. Yeah. So um, just to initially start, if this conversation is interesting to you, there is a three hour YouTube interview between Eric Weinstein and uh, Peter Thiel. Uh, and the name of the uh, the YouTube video, it's episode one of Eric's podcast, The Portal. And the name of that on the YouTube, you can find it is an era of stagnation and universal institutional failure. And it's a three hour conversation where really compelling, com- like I found it like it fascinated me because I it was it was actually recorded in July of 2019. So six months before COVID hit. And I think there's a really interesting conversation to have now that everything's totally changed. And the, the real jump off, what really compelled me to write the article is in this three hour interview, the ending of the gold standard and Bitcoin is not mentioned once. They have a three hour conversation about institutional failure and great stagnation. And Bitcoin's not even part of the conversation, which I found to be a really compelling piece to be like, okay, there's more to, there's more to start looking at here and starting to evaluate, right? And for when it comes to like, the stagnation piece. Uh, traditionally, like a very orthodox view is that we live in this world of incredible technology and great opportunity and future. And we're going through rapid innovations. And, you know, we're almost a- a- on the end of, you know, technology is moving too fast. And Peter Thiel describes it as like an accelerationist view of like, we have to be careful of the AI, like the consensus view of what most people think is that like AI is going to take over the world. And we have to be really careful about that. And what Eric and Peter discuss in this conversation is that it's probably more likely on the other end. And they they bring this, uh, they break it into two camps, right? Because to give credit to where it's due, the world of bits, semiconductors, communications, chips, and like the, the whole world of the internet and technology on the silicone layer has massively had progress, obviously, since the 1970s, right? This is mostly, you could accredit it to this thing called Moore's Law, which is every two years, the number of transistors you can fit on a computer chip doubles and the cost gets cut in half. And that's why our parents' computers, you know, were very uh, old, clunky, inefficient and expensive compared to what we're able to do now. And I make an anecdote in the article that the Apollo one mission that went to the moon had less computing power than a graphing calculator you would get as like a sophomore in high school. Right. And thinking about the fact that, you know, we're holding all these big, crazy celebrations because Richard Branson and, uh, is launching himself into space and Jeff Bezos launching himself into space. And it's like, yeah, but you have like 5 million X computing power. Like, like it's almost like easy mode, right? Like, like, and I'm not a physicist. I'm not an aeronautical engineer, right? I don't want to take for granted, you know, what has changed, but the fact that we send ourselves to the moon in 1969, you know, it, it makes you question in the world of physical development, we haven't had that huge step function. And uh, Peter Thiel has this really interesting way of phrasing it, right? Is that, we live in a Star Trek universe where we've put all of our attention into building the supercomputer. You know, when Picard says computer, you know, where is this person, right? Or, you know, computer, how far away from this, right? And it's like super futuristic and cool because this computer had all of the answers. It actually seems kind of antiquated and quaint compared to like everyone having a supercomputer in their pocket with our smartphones, right? Uh, but we, we, ha- we don't have the holodeck. We don't have the replicator. We don't have the warp drive. We're, we're almost kind of like trying to reconcile the fact that this one element of technology has accelerated so far ahead of everything else. And we're kind of trying to understand where everything else, which has largely been stagnant in the world of atoms, uh, how do you reconcile that, right? And, and Eric Weinstein has a, has a perspective of it on, uh, if you were to walk into a room today and you removed everything that had a screen, is there anything really different between a room today and a room in the 1970s outside of aesthetic tastes? And that was a really compelling point was that, you know, looking through family albums and stuff that like the house that my grandfather built and I grew up in largely looked the same except for the TV size and, the, and like, and like maybe some like furniture aesthetics, but like there hasn't been a huge step function compared to like my grandfather and the home he grew up in had massive like changes in orientation and technology, right. With through the industrial revolution. And I think there's a lot of branches to have off in that conversation, but that's one of the main pieces and the thrust of my article is that, the world of bits has greatly accelerated and atoms have stagnated. And the one, actually the way I kind of tied into Bitcoin, funny enough, is uh, with Bitcoin miners. Because uh, if anyone follows the silicone space with Bitcoin miners, the S9 miner, which came out in 2017, uh, took 90 watts of energy to generate one terahash a second. 
a million hashes a second. The S19J, which came out in August of last, uh, uh, in August of this year, August 2021, uses 30 watts to use one tera hash. So in three and a half years, they've been able to increase the efficiency of that silicone by 66%, right? Going from 90 to, to 30 tera hashes, right? From an energy efficiency standpoint. But anyone, and this is kind of like the, the looking over the edge, so to speak, anyone who's in Bitcoin mining now will tell you that the current generation hardware isn't going to have this massive step function upward for the next generation of Bitcoin miners, because we're actually hitting a point now where the circuitry in all of the Bitcoin mining chips, the five nanometer distance is actually hitting against the edges of known physics, where electrons can start jumping from one circuit to the other, and you start getting unreliable circuits. So even the world of bits is starting to hit a wall of stagnation and what's possible. Well, um, I think, again, a ton, a ton to unpack there. I think that your, you know, your conclusion that, you know, the growth that bits has really kind of carried, um, you know, is going to be slowing down. And part of that is part of the, and what I would say is part of the broken incentive structure of the current system, which is like, if you look at Apple, what's their incentive? Their incentive is to take my iPhone 10s and obsolete it in less than four years, right? But on the flip side, you mentioned how the S9 is, you know, uh, sixty-six percent less efficient than the, a modern uh, Bitmain ASIC. But at the same time, an S9 is still like almost every S9 is still plugged in. It's found a home where it's yeah. actually economically feasible. So, like Bitcoin, actually, it presents an opposite incentive structure away from like wasting the innovations in bits. And actually, I think it's going to help us squeeze more out of it because we're not going to have this incentive to have planned obsolescence through, you know, the need to continue having growth, which is a big part of the article, which is this idea of the embedded growth obligation. But before I dive into that, because that's pretty freaking heady, I kind of want to just take a quick step back and like, let's Please just do. tease yeah. out like, what is the world of bits? And what is the world of um, atoms. And I think maybe we should have started with this, but like, you know, I think you, you got pretty close to explaining both, but maybe just like really concretely define both just so it's super clear for the rest of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My apologies for not, uh, starting off there. Um, I'm learning as someone who, um, hasn't really written much before that you look at your own words, you know, and you read your own article, you know, dozens of times you forget how to like go through that whole process and like step through step by step. But, uh, the, the way I would view it as is, uh, and the way it's framed in this uh, longer interview between Eric and Peter, is the the world of bits is the world of semiconductors, the world of chips, right? The, the, what we can modernly view as technology, right? If you're talking to someone who's under the age of forty, they're thinking of technology. They're not thinking of supersonic jets. They're not thinking of, you know, what is the latest like going on in nuclear fission. Like they're not like they're, they're thinking about what's going on in their phone and what's plugged into their computers, right? All of that silicone is the world of bits, and the world of atoms would be fundamentally everything in the physical world, right? Uh, I think there's, there was an interesting inflection point post-World War II where we spent so much of our intellectual capital developing nuclear weapons and putting rockets at the tip of those nuclear weapons to send them anywhere we want to in the world. And once we were able to send nuclear weapons and blow up the world 10 times over, there was almost kind of a feeling of like, okay, we're done here. Like kind of this, this world of like the physical reactions and, and uh, had this large drop off and diminishing returns where we started looking for where that evergreen pasture was. And that's where bits come in with Moore's law, right? Being able to have great efficiency jumps every two years guaranteed. Okay. That makes sense. All right, Bitcoiners. I want to tell you about our newest sponsor. This show is brought to you by Ledin.io. I have been super, super impressed with the guys over at Ledin. I've actually known the co-founders, Adam and Mauricio, for a very long time. I've had the pleasure to watch them build Ledin up from a tiny, tiny startup to now a super impressive institutional grade Bitcoin and crypto lender. Y'all, I'm so impressed with these guys. They are offering some of the best rates out there. I don't think anyone even comes close to touching them. You can get 6.1% APY on your first two Bitcoin that you deposit into lead and interest accounts. And you can get 8.5% US on USDC deposits. I mean, I know all the competitors. They're not even close. If you're going to put your crypto and your Bitcoin into an interest account, Ledin is by far the best. And on top of that, like I said, these guys are hardcore Bitcoiners and they know the products and the services that Bitcoiners 
want and appreciate. They come up with B2X. It allows you to put your Bitcoin in. They leverage it up and you can, with one click of the mouse, get twice the exposure to Bitcoin. So if you're super bullish, Ledin has you covered with a super, super easy way to get leverage with B2X. And then on top of that, they know that Bitcoiners care about your reserves. They know that Bitcoiners don't like under-reserved and not full-reserved financial institutions. So they are pushing the frontier in transparency in the digital asset lending space. And they are the first digital asset lender to do a full proof of reserves and proof of attestation through a Mariano LLC, a public accounting firm. So the letting guys, they know what Bitcoin is like. They are legit. I encourage you guys to check them out. Do your own research and go to ledin.io. That is L-E-D-N.io and learn more. Bitcoiners, I want to tell you about the deep dive. The deep dive is Bitcoin Magazine's premium market intelligence newsletter. This is a no fluff hard-hitting, incredible newsletter going deep into the market, helping you understand what's happening with derivatives, what's happening on-chain, what's happening in macro, what's happening with the narrative, and what's happening with the tech. My man Dylan LeClaire is an absolute savant. He is making his name known in the Bitcoin community, getting shout outs left and right, getting on podcasts left and right, and him and his team are bringing you everything that you need to know about Bitcoin. You don't even have to be on Bitcoin Twitter. You can ignore every other newsletter. This is the newsletter to rule them all. Go over to members.bitcoinmagazine.com. Sign up today. And if you use promo code macro, you get a full month for free. You have nothing to lose. What are you waiting for? Sign up, see the incredible work that Dylan and his team are putting out. And if you don't like it, just unsubscribe. You don't pay a dime. But if you do, you know, it's going to be well worth the sats in investment in understanding Bitcoin and gaining the confidence to continue to invest in Bitcoin and making the right moves around Bitcoin. And it's going to be well worth every single Satoshi. Uh, Again, can't recommend it enough. That is members.bitcoinmagazine.com, promo code macro. Do it today. So... Um, just to like set the framework here, you know, 1970 era is where we start seeing this divergence between bits and atoms and really a massive stagnation in the world of atoms. You know, you look back to 1970 homes, Peter Thiel or the Eric Weinstein, uh, Weinstein examples that you subtract the screens, pretty much everything else is, is in the same state. Um, so, you know, they had air con, they had a lot, they had insulated windows at that point, like maybe it wasn't as like tight or clean. I don't know. You could argue maybe they're better. Who knows? Um, But uh, so we're at this position where there's this divergence. um, Things start getting kind of weird and our institutions start failing. But at the same time, the institutions are forced to act in a certain way, even to the detriment. Right. And that's where, again, this embedded growth obligation, which uh, it perfectly, you know, is an acronym uh, is ego. Um, so uh, it's, it's very interesting. Like these institutions have this ego that's a problem. But let's talk about embedded growth obligation. What is it? And then like, let's put it into context. Yeah. So I think it even, and, and I wish I put this in the article thinking about this more now. Um, in the post-World War II order, uh, where the Allied powers had won, there was this coming together of an idea of that we now have the capability of causing mass destruction with nuclear weapons. And the best way to stave that off is for everyone to be economically interdependent with each other, right? This is an idea of if we're trading and we're all growing together, we're less likely to have violence. And this is a common theme that comes up in the interviews that you have two poles, uh, violence and growth. And as long as you can organically generate growth, you're able to stave off violence. So Embedded growth obligations, uh, as defined by Eric, is the idea of how fast does an institution need to grow for it to honestly maintain its positions? Uh, And this, like, as you said, it could be thought of as like the ego an institution has in its own right, where this is the idea of the institution operating in the world and how does it interact with everyone else? And just to level set what an institution is, right? Because I tried to define the term to make it like understandable. It's not just your government. It could be your church. 
It could be your media. It could be your universities. It could be a corporation, right? Like there's many branches of like these, these mediating sense-making organs and how us as individuals come together and organize in a society is how I would package the general idea of what an institution is. Um, and embedded growth obligations is this idea that all of these larger institutions that have control in the world have this implicit assumption buried underneath them is that there needs to be a certain base level growth rate for them to be happily maintained. And I use an example in the article of university professors and grad students. If you have one professor of a department and they have 10 grad students, let's say half of them want to go on and become professors themselves. That means that you now need to find out of those five grad students who went to go on and be professors, you need now need to find 50 students to be able to sustain that. And in the post-World War II era, that was a really easy thing to do. College wasn't really that crowded out yet. It was very easy to have a bunch of new people in the ascending upper middle class and lower middle class going in and finding a way to get a great path to success by going to college, right? And over time, what you start having happen though, is it almost starts turning into a pyramid scheme because unless every single person in the country is gonna become a grad student, you can't organically have this ascending hierarchy of undergraduates on top of graduates onto professors and PhDs. Like you can't do that forever because that's not like, at some point you hit a wall in being able to organically generate that growth. And that's where embedded growth obligations come in. And then to tie it into a concrete example with universities, in the United States now, um, US student loan debt is not dischargeable. You go to school, you take out student loan debt, that money goes to the university. If you look at graphs of a number of administrators per student, that's massively taken off since the 80s. I think in 2002, 2003, student loan debt across the country was $300 billion. It's now $1.7 trillion. And anyone who's empirically looking at the data of what happens to your salary when you leave a college university, you're not seeing a massive uptick to justify that expense anymore. And this is a perfect idea of an embedded growth obligation where the institution of education is no longer serving individuals in the idea of getting a better education. It's now gone to how do you best perpetuate education as an institution, putting as much money through education as possible and turning almost parasitic instead of properly serving the common public, it's just turned into a means of being able to generate money and being able to extract value out of our youngest and the ones that are most likely, you know, the youngest in the future. We're basically mortgaging the future to bring money into the present, which is another branch into the article. But that's how I would kind of talk about an embedded growth obligation. So the interesting example is pretty, in or sorry, the, the, uh, the, the university example is pretty interesting, but I also really liked your example of IBM and stock buybacks. So let's dive into that yes, one just because please. I think the numbers paint a very clear picture on how parasitic this is if tuition prices by themselves aren't enough. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny enough, I actually, um, I was a former employee of IBM and I left in uh, June of this year. I, my team personally, I had, we, we did great innovation and did great things. It's a company of 300,000 employees though. So this isn't a commentary on what I was doing at IBM, but just to the general macro framework of a large company like this. So since 1995, IBM has spent $200 billion, $800 million in stock buybacks. If you look at the current valuation of IBM, the market cap of the company, it's only $125 billion. They've, they've spent 1.5x of the company's entire value over the past 25 years on stock buybacks. And I think this is a great example of just massive capital misallocation and wealth destruction to be able to point to and say, if, if you've spent that much money in just buying back your own shares, I think there's a good conversation to be had of how does this happen? And I think this goes to the earlier point you were making about why do we have such weak leaders today in our institutions? So within IBM, there, like, there's almost a prisoner's dilemma that forms. Large publicly traded companies, the executive team, the C-suite get compensated on stock options. And with stock options, if increasing the stock price is your path, as a corporate executive to be able to get an outsized pay return, 
you know, you have two options. Do I shepherd moonshot projects that may take 15 to 20 years to pan out? Remember, IBM was one of the original innovators for the whole semiconductor revolution and, and bringing PCs to the home. But do you do moonshot projects that may take decades to pan out long after you retire? Or do you take your existing cash flow, the, the, the goose that lays the golden egg, so to speak, and take that and just take that cash into the market and buy your own shares back, which is almost a market signal of saying, we have no better use for this cash, so we're just going to buy back our own stock, right? There's nothing else that we could be doing right now. There's no capital that we could be allocating more efficiently. And it, 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 it speaks to this problem of just short-term market incentives, which I think is a, a conversation Bitcoiners are very familiar with, with the fiat economy, being able to distort price signals through money printing and capital disproportionately being flown to people who hold assets, right? This is part of that race of uh, being able to just throw your money somewhere. So you're just going to throw it into your own stock. And to bring it to like the idea of like where you have this prisoner's dilemma, if, if you're a middle level employee at IBM, are you going to go to your boss and say, hey, I think the corporate team here is really misallocating their capital. We should be getting more of that money to do work and invest on these other projects. That's probably not going to go well. And the reason why is because anyone who's within the management structure of a large company like that, their hope is to get promoted. And they can't get promoted if their boss doesn't like them. And especially if you're trying to, you know, you know, be the skunk at the garden party when it comes to executive pay. Because to say explicitly, let's not take all this money and do spot stock buybacks is basically saying, hey, uh, chief executive officer, could you make less money so we can maybe invest into the future well after you're gone? Not going to be a fun conversation, right? So it, operating with an institution, you almost have to have the shared lie of everyone needs to be you, you need to be willing to kind of keep on the charade that, you know, there's organic growth and that everything is doing well. And this is why we get such bad leaders. And this is not just in companies, this is in politics in you know, media institutions, right? Like you basically have this prisoner's dilemma of no one can speak the truth. No one's able to actually, uh, no one, no one's able to actually try and market correct these forces because there's just so much malinvestment built up into the system that you, you, uh, as a member of the organization can't do anything. And the silver lining I bring to this and tie into Bitcoin is that individuals are the one group who are immune from embedded growth obligations. Because if you as an individual, not part of an institution, are able to step forward and say, this isn't going well, I don't think this is right, you don't have to worry about retribution on the other end of it. And I think that's a strength that Bitcoiners have is people who are baseline very independent thinkers that think outside the box, they're heterodox, they're, they're willing to speak their mind, this is a great asset that Bitcoiners have as a culture and a community and being able to, you know, try and address these wrongs in the ways that they see that they have power to do so. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, again, you hit on so many really, really important points, right? And um, again, like they're trapped. No one is 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 free of their incentives. I think it's a super famous Charlie Munger quote, which is that, um, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcomes. And like, I think what you spell out, you know, is the, the broken incentives. And, you know, again, you can look, you brought up the IBM, I'll bring up, you know, the Green New Deal, um, yeah. where, you know, they're going to be spending supposedly $3 trillion if it passes. And, you know, the government economists are saying for every $3 spent, we'll get $1 of growth, right? So like, okay, where does, where does the, <laughs> where's the other $2 go? One, and then two, is um so if those if like the government people are saying that then like what what is the number really right and it just shows again like like how how is this capital allocation working and when you have fake price of money aka low interest rates so when you um you know start creating this short-term thinking and uh you know you know maybe you you can go as far as like when you separate store of value from money like and you have other assets becoming store of value and needing scarcity um, it all gets, it all just gets really crazy. And I mean, I think that's where Bitcoin presents this opportunity to kind of bring some soundness back to our measure of reality. Um, you know, a lot of people have talked about this, Jeff Booth with the price of tomorrow, um, for turning, maybe it's not about Bitcoin, but it's about the shift in these institutions. Uh, I'll send it back to you. And like, you know, again, Weinstein and Teal, they didn't talk about the money and you're trying to make this connection of how, you know, it's all about the money. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the inflation conversation is a really interesting point I mentioned in the article that uh, no, no mainstream economist today 
let me, let me flip this on its head. All mainstream economists today will say that the year over year inflation number is 5.4%. Uh, none of them are going to mention the M2 money supply and that 30% of all money in existence today has been in the past 18 months. Additionally, None of them are going to mention that 75, three out of every $4, have been created since the 2008 financial crisis. And this is a part of these embedded growth obligations and this internal lie that needs to be perpetuated forward when it comes to calculating inflation is a perfect example of economics, which very neatly lines up with Bitcoin. Uh, I was listening to um, the Odd Lots podcast, uh, which is Joe Weisenthal, with uh, Omar Sharif, who's a, an investment banker who doesn't very complicated, all of the CPI calculations and doing research on all of them. And it was all of this really like complicated math and structuring and organizing the basket of goods. And it's like this very like hidden alchemy almost, right? Whereas like, if you just ask the simple question that doesn't require a PhD of how many dollars are in the system, like, oh, that's a very juvenile take. Like you don't understand how inflation works. Like it's almost like kind of derided as just kind of like a very simplistic view. But at the end of the day, it's the least gameable metric. Right. Like the idea that uh, you need this priestly class of experts to be able to like, you know, go into a back room and shake a bunch of Excel spreadsheets around and, and game what's in the basket and say, well, there's a hedonistic adjustment because our quality of life is better compared to last year. Um, it's it's all just a lie. It, it, it's it's this entire just elaborate ruse to try and paint this little cover on that, like everything is fine. And this is part of the embedded growth obligation is that. If you're an economist and you're working at the Federal Reserve or you're working at a big investment bank, like, like you heard the expression, you never fight the Fed. Like, what are you going to do? Like, tell them that they're liars, like, and then just lose your job and lose your entire social network and all of the capital that's tied into your career and development and growth. Like, this is why uh, the incentives are fundamentally broken. And it's a total distortion of price signals. And you bring up a great point with the Federal Reserve and money in general in that, like, the Federal Reserve, I actually called them this article, they're the chief growth officer of the company. Uh, of the company of the United States, because like you, you have this piece where, um, it, the, the, in the research and trying to form this article, trying to bring it back to money in the United States, since 1971, we've had a 6% compounded annual growth rate, CAGR, which means every year, 6% growth, 6% growth over 50 years. And as we mentioned earlier in the world of bits, there's some honest growth going on here right? Like it's not all illegitimate, but you start looking at the underlying financial system and the, the debt financing and the debt instruments we use is this way of being able to pull consumption from the future, bring it into the present and have the party now, right? And now we don't like economists today say we don't have to worry about paying back that debt later because, you know, debt is just money we owe to ourselves as Paul Krugman would say, right? Uh, it's this total distortion of price signals in gaming the growth number of the GDP of the country but it's not the same when, when we're growing like our balance sheet and everything's being blown out. I, I, I don't want to avoid going off on another tangent, but I want to like, if you have any thoughts there to kind of talk about before I go down that rabbit hole. Well, I mean, again, I think like we're living in clown world and we're at peak yes. clown world where, you know, guys like Paul Krugman say debt, debt is money we owe to ourselves. The reality is, is that savings is money that you earned for yourselves and you saved for yourself, right? That's, that's like how to pass value into the future not debt debt is taking away from the future so i think that there's just again it's just broken incentives right which is why when you are at eric weinstein or are peter Thiel, and you're having this conversation it's just ludicrous to not look at like what is the thing that is signaling what we should do and you dive into this too like and i think uh, again uh, aaron siegel who's a really really great contributor to bitcoin magazine um he said like you know, we don't know, like the the, the compounding uh, 2% interest rate, like we don't know how insidious that really is because we don't know what, you know, three generations of misallocated schooling, you know, is doing, right? Like we have all these people doing one thing and uh, we, you know, maybe we do not need that at all in the economy, right? And then what's the pain of that, of that unraveling? So like the, the negative 2%, like it, and, and the where, the control of the monetary system or the manipulation of the monetary system like that uh it's gonna blow up in a way that i think a lot of people is bigger than what a lot of people think and you know it's because the 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 entropy is is greater too so i guess i'll i'll end my ramble and i'll pass it back to you <laughs> yeah i know uh it, there is always this hidden cost when it comes to distorting market signals and 
it, you're not able to understand what, what the other reality would have been, right? All, all we can do now in our control is talk about how can we fix things to move forward. And there's this interesting point when I was researching the article uh, that I hadn't heard before and poking around a bit, no one's pushed back on me yet. Uh, 1977 was the first year we had a 30 year bond auction. Before then it was usually 10 years. I think we had 25 years for a couple years in between 1970 and 1977. But the 30 year debt instrument, I think is this, when you combine it with money printing is this insidious dynamic of perpetual can kicking because 10 years is enough time to actually have some sort of accountability loop back boomerang on an individual who's in power. 30 years is become so distant where even if like someone who was in Congress 30 years ago is still there now, they can take, they can deflect it to a bunch of other problems and a bunch of other circumstances. It's distancing accountability between the action and the consequences. And what I really look at it is like with the federal reserve, going into the debt markets and interfering by interfering with interest rates is we're not actually able to get correct signals, right? We're not able to correct and understand where capital misallocation is occurring. We're not able to understand um, how we're interfering with the market. And I really view it as this really sick insidious way where interest rates fundamentally are this negotiation between the present and the future. Meaning that if the interest rate is higher, you're going to be rewarded today for holding into the future. And also the higher the interest rate, the more punished you will be for capital misallocation because that's your opportunity cost of money. And what's happened is with interest rates being lowered more and more over time, we've reduced that opportunity cost to where you you almost just outright incentivize just horrible capital mis mismanagement. And it's one of these things where I, I view it as almost like this uh, intergenerational conflict where um, our ruling class, which are largely silent generation and baby boomers, are almost just kind of casting the future generations off into like a financial pyre, right? There's no interest rates. There's no value in saving for tomorrow. You're also laden up with a bunch of debt from college. Like you can't discharge it, right? And it's all being served just at the idea of how do we perpetuate growth today? And it's, it's something that I think that as Bitcoiners, the answer is we have to build our own institutions, which I think is where a lot of an interesting conversation is, is how does a decentralized movement organize itself to build new institutions? But I think the one thing we can start with is the institution of Bitcoin. There's only 21 million Bitcoin. There is no inflation. No one has that power. We're all equal. And we use those as like the foundational building blocks for building a better future. Yeah, I love that. And again, it's it's about opting into an alternative system, right? Because if you're stuck in that old system, you always have the ego, you always have this embedded growth obligation, which kind of prevents you from breaking it, right? Um, and again, like, it is really sad, you know, the reality of the current uh, generations, but it's at times like this is when you kind of have to just burn it down and start over. Um, and that, that's where like, there's this huge opportunity for Bitcoin. Bitcoiners, let's take a break from the content. And I want to tell you about Coolbix. Coolbix is an awesome Bitcoin hardware wallet that has been around for a really long time. They are building an amazing Bitcoin wallet called the Cool Wallet Pro. The Cool Wallet Pro is state of the art Bitcoin hardware wallet technology. Its form factor is like a credit card. You can put it into your wallet and it is designed to go with you on the go. So that way, even when you're on the go, you can have the benefit of a two-factor uh, hardware wallet design when you're trying to spend your Bitcoin. So you can have your Bitcoin uh, wallet uh, UX on your phone and make it really easy to scan, decide what you want to do. But then you sign with a cool bit X, which is in your back pocket. It is tamper proof. It is waterproof. It is flexible. It has an awesome secure element in it. And it is a really awesome way in order to have some more flexibility, yet security when you're taking your Bitcoin on the go. I personally am a fan of, you know, this idea of making Bitcoin into a medium of exchange and making it into something that people use. I know it's going to take time, but they are working on the UX for making that possible in as secure a way possible. So uh, have some peace of mind. Check out the Cool Wallet Pro from Cool Bix. Uh, and yeah, thank you to them for sponsoring this podcast.
Bitcoiners, I am so excited to tell you about the Bitcoin 2022 conference. You guys, Bitcoin 2021 was absolutely a smash hit success. It was over 13,000 Bitcoiners coming together, breaking the barriers on who can come together and celebrate freedom, celebrate Bitcoin, and the energy was absolutely electric. Unfortunately, it was just oversubscribed. There's just people flowing out everywhere. And this year we are learning, we are making the conference bigger and better. We are moving over to the Miami Beach Convention Center, and we are going to be throwing a massive four-day festival for Bitcoin, celebrating Bitcoin, bringing together the greatest minds in Bitcoin and the greatest businesses in Bitcoin. And lastly, the culture of Bitcoin all together. We have a four-day extravaganza planned for you guys for Bitcoin 2022. Uh, day one is going to be industry day. It is a day where you can buy a special ticket in order to uh, just mingle and make business deals happen. Day two and three is going to be a full-blown Bitcoin conference. This is our main conference. This is going to be on April 7th and 8th. And then lastly, we have the Sound Music Festival day four. Imagine going to Coachella. But for Bitcoin, there's going to be very few talks. It's going to be all about the culture of Bitcoin. It's going to be all about hanging with your fellow plebs. It is going to be an absolutely amazing time. There's going to be Bitcoin musicians, Bitcoin artists, and all your favorite Bitcoiners and just an amazing environment to party and just see it all, soak it all in, and to get people to realize that a Bitcoin world, a world filled with Bitcoin people doing Bitcoin things is the world that they want to live in. That's what Bitcoin 2022 is all about. That is what the Bitcoin conference is all about. That's what Bitcoin magazine is all about. So it is going to be a celebration of Bitcoin, the Bitcoiners, and this amazing movement that is going to make the world a better place. Go to b.tc forward slash conference. Learn more about the Bitcoin conference. Learn more about all the amazing things that are happening in Miami around the Bitcoin conference and buy your tickets. And guess what? If you buy your bit tickets with Bitcoin, you save $100 on all the tickets and $1,000 on the whale pass. So if you want the VIP pass, the, the big kahuna, if you buy with Bitcoin, you save $1,000. That's a lot of stats. So go and do it right now today. Don't wait. Prices are only going up. This is going to be a can't miss event. <laughs> Um, something that you discussed too is, you know, obviously if Bitcoin does play out how we think, Bitcoiners, people who are very early, and it's still, there's still plenty of time to be a part of that, um, they're going to be the capital allocators, right? And, um, and they're going to be kind of allocating in a Bitcoinized future, which is kind of hard to imagine these days, to be honest, because um, many of us can't think of you know, moving on from our Bitcoin, right? We're just trying to stack as much as possible, which is the rational thing to do in this, you know, present day. But let's just go to like that future. The world is is Bitcoinized, kind of organized around this fair monetary standard where we can just continue to build off of that. What do the capital allocators do? How is it different? Yeah, so I think looking into that future, um, the the ideas of how we're going to structure our Bitcoin, we're already, you know, as a, as a, as a large, just cultural subset are people that are very fine with delaying gratification, right? If you're holding Bitcoin for a long period of time, you're comfortable with the idea of you're not going to see an immediate return on your asset. And I think what it starts happening is, is that we start investing in things for a future that we may ourselves not be able to fully see, right? Like maybe like, like larger projects, you know, like, things are going to take years, not quarterly earning statements. And that's like, we're not going to be caught up in like, you know, what's the stock price today, right? Like it's something that we're going to be very comfortable with, like throwing money into an investment and having it take a decade or longer to pan out. Uh, from my, con like this conversation of the article that I was trying to work on all started on Clubhouse and uh, American HODL would spend a lot of time. We would, we would chat a lot about like, this idea, and we were talking about this interview specifically, we both went back and listened to it. And he did a really great um, talk at Bitblock Boom about this. And he described it as destroying the one-time uh, Cantillon effect, right? Is that Bitcoiners are going to be this mass receiver of disproportionate wealth from one last go of the money printer, right? In the sense that the collapse of a fiat economy is going to result in Bitcoiners to have disproportionate wealth. And that's kind of a way 
it's investment that's well earned, but in the same way, it's almost like kind of this remnant of a former fiat system. And the responsibility you have is to invest that into a better future, right? And being able to think about what are the larger projects that are going to take a lot of time and a lot of capital to be able to start moving off the ground, whether that's, you know, Eric Weinstein has this whole thing about like, you know, reinvigorating like physics departments, but going outside in like fit universities because universities are so far gone, you can't trust them anymore, right? Maybe, it, you know, working with like inter interspace travel, you know, working on, you know, anything that is that maybe formerly had been left outside the box of orthodoxy in traditional society. Like those are the doors and paths that we start exploring to be able to try and, you know, correct m capital misallocation that's been going on for decades. Well, again, I think, you know, where that kind of comes full circle to how we started the conversation, I think one of those big areas is energy production, right? And, you know, we've go, we've seen the, the, the blinding of all fossil fuels, we've seen the, the quote unquote, discrediting and decommissioning of nuclear across the globe. And then we've seen this like allocation into like solar wind, right? Things that make us feel good. It looks yeah. good. It looks like it's like, grabbing energy from the environment um you could call it fiat energy to some degree and like i love the planet i'm a nature guy um and you know where bitcoiners are going to invest is kind of where they're investing right now is, is in energy production and energy utilization and you know again you can bring up the flaring uh and mining and, and that kind of revolution and the huge efficiencies that come from that and it makes you again bullish on how Bitcoiners are going to kind of correct the misallocation and kind of, you know, set us straight again. Yeah, I I don't think there's any way to overstate the potential of what Bitcoin provides to for energy markets as a buyer of first and last resort when it comes to energy production. And I think it, the being the being able to monetize energy and understanding, and this is one of the things that I did not understand maybe until the past year or two learning about Bitcoin mining, because I'm not an industrial miner by any means, but just understanding like how energy markets work and how these are all interlinked with each other and how fundamentally just the quality of human life is directly linked to how much energy consumption is being done per human, right? It enables more opportunity, more resources. It's something that is something that is often swept aside in modern narratives. And uh, I think it's a huge wasted opportunity. And I think Bitcoin is going to directly financially incentivize correcting those because now you have a source of being able to monetize that energy and bringing a more complete fair energy market to play. I think that's really, really exciting on part of that future and kind of the early things we're starting to see now with oil and gas companies starting to get more involved with Bitcoin. Um, you know, there what Compass Mining was working with that nuclear power plant in Ohio, right, to do Bitcoin mining, right? I think we're going to start realizing like how much change is in the couch cushions when it comes to just this energy that's stranded and laying around, and how can we harness that, you know, to be able to better like make our grid more robust. I think it's an amazing opportunity that Bitcoin today provides that great financial incentive for moving forward. I love that metaphor of change in the couch cushion. So it's like that, like the existing <laughs> grid has all of these inefficiencies everywhere that Bitcoin right. can just help you monetize. And then that we're not talking about like, okay, then what happens to the couch after Bitcoin's been kind of building it out and like get incentivizing the spread of the new energy grid. Um, Brandon Quidham in his like super famous article back in the day, I think it was like 2018 these days, that's back in the day, but he dropped the Bitcoin is mycelium article. And in that article, he shows the slime mold and how it outcompeted Japanese architects in, in creating the most, uh, the most efficient network uh, across Japan or across Tokyo or something along those lines. Um, and I, I truly think that Bitcoin is kind of like that virtual slime mold that is going to create the the most insanely efficient energy grid infrastructure that uh, we could ever imagine. Yeah, Jordan Peterson talks about how the idea of systems that do not require coercion are healthier and more sustainable than ones that require coercion. And I think ultimately Bitcoin as a voluntary opt-in system is able to bootstrap a new parallel society almost where you like there there is a ultimate like almost an alternative economy and an alternative incentive structure and framework. And I think what's really fascinating about Bitcoin, and I think why it caught Eric's attention a while ago was it was this idea of being able to route around corrupt institutions. The Federal Reserve 
are liars. The economists are not our friends. They are fleecing the public. And what we did instead of crying about it and, and like, like I, I was a gold and silver bug back in 2011, 2012, before I found out about Bitcoin, right? But like, how futile does that feel compared to being able to buy Bitcoin and directly just disrupt the whole system? And Bitcoin leveraged technology to disintermediate corrupt institutions with reality that was backed by math and cryptography instead of being backed by you know word of mouth or at the barrel of a gun. And that's such an incredible, powerful idea that we're just using math and it's voluntary. No one's forcing you to use it. And it's one of these things that I think it's such a great case study and example of how do you build a new institution, right? Because even though Bitcoin is just code at the end of the day, there is a social consensus layer that surrounds it that kind of girds the network, right? And that's when we have cultural moments of reflection like 2017 with the fork wars, right? Being able to understand like the mob policy is just a variable. You could change it to 23 million or 100 million or whatever you want to change it to, but that's not going to happen because of the social consensus, right? And the way the software is structured. I think it's such an incredible way. And it's an uplifting story of being able to take agency and sovereignty and being able to have that responsibility. And how do you push back and re grab that control of agency so you're not beholden to corrupt institutions? No, I mean, and I guess just not to correct, but you know, I think it's, there's this social consensus that leans against the hardware consensus because there's this like active physical network of hardware consensus. And that is the thing that's actually incorruptible. So the fact that kind of like the social consensus is that we rely on this physical network um, is, you know, it's very, very powerful because now it creates like this institution, this physical real institution that also it can't be fucked with by anyone that is like beyond the reach of anyone else and like that is the beautiful thing like that's the that is the fight against the the old system is just saying like there's this real physical thing that is undeniable you can't mess with it and now we get to see them compete right and let's see what happens yeah it, it's it's a free market right you get to have your system we get to have our system and i think this is where the interesting inflection point of like Bitcoin as it continues to succeed and grow. I, this is where my, my time diet, like I, I now have two kids under two years old. I start thinking about the world they're going to grow up in where they always had Bitcoin, right? They, they weren't at this transition point of between a Bitcoin and a fiat currency that Bitcoin had always been around. We may have fiat currency in 10 years or whatever, but the idea that this was, this isn't a new thing to them. is something they, that's older than them. And I start thinking and looking forward to Bitcoin as a system. Like for me, hyper Bitcoinization isn't a success. For me, it's the world that my great great grandkids will you know will grow up in. People who I will never meet far down my family tree is Bitcoin a meaningful tool to be able to make their lives better. And I'm and this is um, NVK calls like uh, Bitcoin deterministic optimism, right? In the sense that you have this base consensus layer of a society, money, that has now been solved. We no longer need kings. We no longer need armies. We have math that is able to back and support that fundamental human interaction. How much prosperity can come through in a society when we have a voluntary opt-in currency? Uh, I, I think the future is really the, like like the, the sky is the limit, and it's literally in the sense that you know the stars. Like like we're able to reorganize. As ourselves and being able to break out of, you know, the, the short-term games of quarterly earning statements and, you know, trying to appease and jockey for political power. We just, we just went and took it. We went and built our own things. And I think that's such a positive, like, outlook for what the future potential has. Wow. I think that is the most powerful place that we could end this podcast. Rob, thanks for bringing it, man. Uh, to all the, to all the listeners, you got to read this article it is going to be in the show notes but really just going deep into like, why hasn't technology gotten to where it should be, right? Outside of the digital, you know, why hasn't everything else gone, gone you know, parabolic as well? Um, and hopefully Bitcoin can fix this. Rob, where can people find you, learn more about you, tease all the good stuff? Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter at Rob One Ham, R-O-B, the number one H-A-M. Uh, you can find me on Clubhouse, same username, talking about Bitcoin pretty regularly. Uh, 
yeah, hoping to, uh, you know, anyone who wants to chat, please, my DMs are open, hit me up. I'm happy to have a conversation about this. Uh, it's been a fun journey uh, starting to finally, after listening about Bitcoin for so many years, writing about it, it's a whole other experience. And I'm really grateful for Bitcoin Magazine for providing the opportunity to publish my, uh, my work. Yeah, man. Well, hey, we'll publish you again. So don't hold back on us and don't be shy. Uh, to all the listeners out there, if you're an inspiring Bitcoin writer, if you've been thinking about Bitcoin, if you've been thinking about the world and how we navigate through that, you know, Bitcoin Magazine is here as a partner, as someone that wants to, uh, you know, just amplify the most signal in the Bitcoin community. So uh, don't be scared to hit us up, slide in the DMs, hit me up on Twitter at CK underscore Snarks, hit our account up at Bitcoin Magazine. Check out this podcast, read Rob's article, get inspired, give us those five-star reviews, share this podcast with everyone. You know the drill. I won't get into it. Uh, we'll catch you later, Rob. Peace. Peace.